All right, can you all hear me okay? Do we have audio? Sweet, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about continuous infrastructure delivery. Um, I tried to come up with a snappy title when I submitted the talk to Bridget, and so I think it says infrastructure edition on the meetup. Um, you know, always a thing with these. Um, I guess first I, I wanted to say like, it, it's actually pretty special for me to be speaking at this event. Um, I think something like four years ago, this very meetup was like my first speaking engagement, um, like the first time I got in front of people and talked about technology. And so it's, it's, it's really cool to be back here. Like I've been in Seattle for about three years now, but like I'm, I'm from here, I started my career here and having participated in other communities outside of the Twin Cities, like I can definitely say with confidence that there's something unique about the community here. And, and hopefully you all can appreciate that. Like you're definitely a part of something that doesn't really exist in any other tech community in any other city that I've been a part of. So like, and, and huge props to the community organizers here of, of the meetup and DevOps days that like make this possible. Like it, it's, it's truly something awesome. So just all of you be appreciative of that. It's, it's really great. Um, so first things, um, I think when we talk about continuous delivery, like, if we look at it in the context of software, I think we're talking about something that's that's fairly established at this point. And maybe not every organization is, is doing this um, because like there is a bit of a ramp up, but I think it, it's something that's been around for a while now and people have been discussing at conferences and online. And so I, I, I think it's we're pretty comfortable saying that we're at a place where this is a, a fairly established pattern. Um, so hopefully some of you have had some exposure to the idea of continuous delivery for software. Um, so when I say that though, like what, what are some of the high level steps that I'm talking about for, for continuous delivery? Um, and the, the ones that immediately come to mind would be like automated testing. That's gonna be like the first core piece of this. It's, it's really um, a very large part of, of CI, CD. Um, extensive automated testing, and then continuous or code integration um, would be the next step in that flow. Um, and it, if you're getting started with, with continuous delivery, this can be something that's a little painful to get ramped up with, like that constant integration. But you know, if, if something is painful, we should probably do it as often as possible to try and alleviate some of that pain. Um, and then lastly, deployment. Um, so that's the, you know, we've got the high level view of, of what this pattern looks like and deployment for this could um, take a lot of forms, whether you're thinking of like on-prem infrastructure for something like vSphere or OpenStack or public cloud. Um, so with, with this lay of the land kind of set out, I think the question that I wanted to address is like, can we take this rather established software pattern and apply it to infrastructure? And so the disclaimer that I want to give is that like, I feel like I go to a lot of talks um, at, at conferences in various places and the, the paradigm is like, here I am the expert up here to explain to you the thing that I know all the things about and you will maybe know some things about when I finish explaining it to you. And for this, like, the, the thing that brought me down this path was I've been a part of a lot of engineering teams that have done continuous delivery, but have like completely ignored it on the infrastructure side. And so it got me kind of thinking about like what this actually looks like to do this for both software and infrastructure. And so it was a, a very exploratory process for me to dig into this. And so I think what I'm trying to do today is share out like some of the patterns that I've learned and come across in exploring this. And so um, I definitely don't want to come across as the all knowing expert that will explain to you the thing because that's, that's not me. I, I am just into the idea of learning in public. So hopefully some of you can get something out of this. Uh, we'll see, I guess. Um, so with that, I will just do a quick little introduction. I'm Xander. I, uh, started my career in Minneapolis here at Target. Um, now I am a developer advocate at HashiCorp. Um, a developer advocate means a lot of different things, I guess. Um, community engineer is the one that I often use to summarize what I do. Um, who knows if that's an actual explanation or not. Um, 
most of my time is spent working with the um, HashiCorp open source community, which is an awesome group of folks. And before that, I did um, SRE work for Microsoft and Starbucks and Target. So I've um, spent a lot of time in the infrastructure space on teams that don't actually continuously deliver infrastructure. So yeah um what, what but seriously even at microsoft it's it's not a common thing to find so hopefully yeah you'll get something from this but yeah yeah anyway um i also wanted to provide a little bit of background context on hashicorp in case folks hadn't heard of us before um we do open source tooling for automation and devops and whatever other buzzword you want to insert into there um uh, yeah, I think the tools are pretty great. I enjoy working with them and maybe some of you have worked with them too, but um, my job is to work with our open source community, which is super fun. And like, we have this awesome community of users behind our tools and it really makes my job super easy that I just get to engage with these people all day. Um, so yeah, check out our tools if you haven't before, ask me questions afterwards, I'm happy to answer anything. Um, so segueing back to continuous delivery, um, I wanted to provide, I guess, a little bit of like high level context. So I talked a little bit about like what the typical flow looks like. I wanted to go over some, I guess, principles or like ideologies behind this um, and, you know, just provide some historical context. And most of this comes from continuousdelivery.com. So if you want to read more verbose descriptions, I highly suggest checking that resource out. Um, but the definition that I got from them was uh, continuous delivery is the ability to get changes of all types, including new features, configuration changes, bug fixes, and experiments into production and in the hands of users safely, quickly, and in a sustainable way. Um, so that's really the, like, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, so some, I guess, philosophies behind this are building quality in um and this one is first for a reason um it's it's one of the core tenets of of this idea um the idea of extensive automated testing end to end um the earlier in our release process that we can identify problems the the lower blast radius it's going to have and so if we've got extensive testing early on in the process, you know, building quality in from the beginning, hopefully the impact on production will be less. Next one, working in small batches. And I'm gonna talk a bit about this later too. Um, the idea of kind of compartmentalizing the work that we're doing um, makes things a lot easier overall. Like if we're getting to that continuous integration phase of this whole process, like if you're only integrating a small little block of code, things are going to be a lot less painful than, you know, this four week long lived feature branch that you have to absolutely suffer through a rebase to like get it merged. Um, and then I think the other benefit for this is, you know, if we're working in these small little batches um, and we learn new information, we, we get new requirements. It's a lot easier to kind of pivot and change direction going forward if you know, we've got these small little compartments. And then the next two are, are kind of philosophical, but worth talking about. Um, the idea of pursuing continuous improvement while we're doing this, um, I think you can't, like it's not gonna work doing CICD if you're not willing to take a good hard look at like what went well and what didn't. And I think this is interesting because it actually maps one-to-one -to, -one to the infrastructure or software that we're developing. Like we're working in these small batches and we're merging code regularly. We can actually see the software itself continuously improve and the benefit that it has to like we as people working on it should be willing to do the same thing if that makes sense. Um, and then the last one, everyone is responsible. And again, this is like a team thing, much less than like a technical thing. Um, I think if you've got a team where all of the people like working in this group 
have some level of responsibility in the thing that you're being worked on, like one, it's indicative of an actual like, healthy team dynamic. Um, it's kind of like at the core of DevOps really, um, which you know often walks hand in hand with CICD. Um, and it's really, um, I think from a production troubleshooting standpoint too, like there is a technical benefit here, right? Like if you were an engineer that works on a product and you've got some level of ownership over the infrastructure and the software component, if you get paged, you probably have like a decent idea of where to look because like you've been in the entire stack. Um, so like really there's, there's a benefit at that level too. So from here, I want to just jump a little bit into like those uh, like steps and kind of talk about how this maps to infrastructure. Um, and like it does in some ways, but doesn't perfectly, but that's part of the fun, right? Um, so automated testing, um, this maps back to that build quality in. Um, super important part about this. Um, and if we're going to do testing for infrastructure, I think there's a couple things that are prerequisites for this. Um, and for this talk, I'm going to talk about Terraform. And this is definitely the part of the talk where my bias shows. Um, I work for HashiCorp. We make a tool called Terraform. Um, <laughs> I can't. I can't like comfortably justify why I'm using Terraform without sounding the brand shill, but um, I, I think um, it, it makes a good case for a talk like this because it's cross-platform and can be used across clouds. Um, that being said, the the core prereq here is infrastructure as code, right? Like, and the the various cloud providers all have their native tooling for this. You've got ARM templates for Azure or CloudFormation for AWS. Um, things like Chef and Ansible, other open source uh, cross-platform solutions. So like, just because I'm using Terraform for the talk, like there's other options out there. And I'm sure like a large percentage of the crowd are, are using a variety of different tools for this. So um, while my examples are Terraform centric, I think hopefully the ideas and the concepts translate. Um, yeah, uh, whoops, wrong way, okay. So um, just to kind of set the stage, I wanted to show a little Terraform code sample um, for, for the examples here. Um, so this is just a simple template using AWS, the provider there, and then building a small little virtual machine um, based on an image stored in an AWS account. Um, pretty straightforward syntax, but that's what it looks like. Um, so Given this, how would we go about testing something like this? Um, and so I'm going to call out a specific framework here that I'm really fond of called TerraTest. Um, and you can find this on GitHub. It's maintained by a company called Gruntwork who have done super awesome things for the Terraform ecosystem and developed a lot of really great tooling. Um, TerraTest, I think, is the closest thing that we can get to like unit testing for infrastructure code for Terraform code. Um, but each of the other infra code tools have their, their methodology for this too. And I know some of the cloud providers are actually working on emulation tools for their, um, for their tools. So like ARM template being able to um, emulate like the actual deployment of that and, and model the behavior of it to understand it. But um, this is what we have for Terraform. Here's a quick little code sample of what a test might look like using TerraTest. And the cool thing about this is that it's actually just Golang code, um, which is what Terraform itself is written in. Um, but if you've written like unit or integration tests using Golang or another language like that, this might look kind of familiar. Um, and I think the thing that's extra cool about this project is that their repository is full of it unreasonable number of examples which like I know you all know is like a rare thing in the world to have good documentation and good examples and so appreciate it when you find it and it's definitely here like they've got like really illustrative examples for pretty much every test case um, super awesome 
And because this is Golang, uh, the awesome thing you can do is just a Go test um, to actually execute the, the tests, which I think is, is great. Um, so now, that being said, a quick note on testing infrastructure code. Um, so in order to actually test this, you do have to deploy live infrastructure. Um, and so th there's a cost incurred with that. Usually if you're running like deploying on a cloud provider, um, it is minimal because you can have things torn down like at the end of the test execution, but like you can't, we're not in a place really where we can unit test an infrastructure code template without spinning up this live infrastructure. You can lint and make sure that syntax is correct, but we can't really understand the behavior of this without deploying the infra. Um, and then the other thing that kind of goes along with this is that because we have to deploy the infrastructure, um, the execution of these tests can be rather long running. Like it's, I know we've all waited for like long builds before and watched the CI tool spinning. That's this, um, it, it, the execution time can be a lot. Um, and the way to alleviate that or at least minimize it um, would be to modularize your infrastructure. And this, this maps back to that, um, that like work in small batches that I talked about at the beginning of this. Um, Terraform supports the idea of a module, kind of compartmentalizing your infra. Um, Chef has their cookbooks, Ansible has playbooks. Um, this is a, a concept that's pretty universal across these tools and critically important if you're going to try and do continuous delivery. Um, you know, that being said, like writing tests for a small block of infra code is gonna be much easier than you know, your main.tf file that has thousands of lines. Um, so I think that's like the other prereq here is to take advantage of that module functionality for the tool that you're using. Um, for Terraform, it looks like this. Um, so ideally, like your various environments, your, your test, your stage, and your prod environment would be composed of just reusable module imports. Um, and that way, you can individually test the modules um, and then reuse them across environments as needed. So after we talk about testing, we get to that continuous integration piece. Um, I don't know why I chose the finger cross emoji. Like I, I guess hoping things like don't break once you hit that button. Um, it works. I yeah. Um, so the continuous integration for um, infrastructure is pretty straightforward. Or for Terraform, once you've done the test validation, um, working in small batches again like really helps this process. Um, but really. You know, you probably want to lint your code to make sure that the syntax makes sense. And then from there, execute your tests. And once we have that check in place, we can run a plan, which is going to show us what's going to change. And then from there, do the actual integration, whether that's like a merging pull request or a get push or whatever form that takes. And once we've got this, we can move on to deployment, the final, final high level thing that we're trying to do here. For Terraform, like super easy, uh, apply. Yeah, couldn't really be more straightforward. Um, but I think when I started putting this together, I thought about like, when you talk about deployment, like what are some modern practices that people are doing for software deployment today? Um, and how do those things map back to infrastructure? And I think people deploy today, they do some testing in production maybe. And I know that like, this is a contentious topic. Like if you've ever been to the cesspool called Twitter, okay. you can see some really, really vicious arguments about this. Uh, it's truly impressive people have that much passion. Um, but I do think this is worth talking about um, because much like continuous delivery itself, I think it allows us to move faster and like automated rollbacks are a thing, it's fine. Um, so feature flags are one way that we test in production. Um, 
and it's it's a highly effective way actually we can we can really roll things out by region or you know there's a lot of flexibility here and we can kind of approximate this behavior with infrastructure um so using terraform um here's a little code sample that maybe you can read hopefully that's big enough um so much like that first example that I showed, um, we've got just this little AWS instance here. Um, but then above that is a Boolean variable. Um, and so we've got this count here that actually enables this resource if that variable is set to true. And so with Terraform at least, like here's how we might approximate like some of that feature flight behavior, which I think is awesome and, and certainly worth your time to explore. Um, Blue-green deployments, um, the other one, um, the idea of having like two live production environments and one of them is actually having traffic routed to it and then we deploy to the other, validate and then shift traffic over and like kind of go back and forth. Um, Rather than show you a code sample for how this works with, with Terraform, I'm just going to point you to this blog post that my super amazing coworker Rosemary wrote. Um, there's just like, she wrote this awesome blog about like feature toggles and blue green deployments and canary tests with Terraform. And because like my time is limited and I'm on slides, and there's not a lot of room, I'm just going to point you to her content because it's really good. Um, this is on the HashiCorp blog, um, hashicorp.com slash blog. If you scroll down a little bit, um, have the Terraform logo on the left of it and you can see the blog post title. But if you are using Terraform, super worth your time to go read this. So once we kind of have all of these ideas in place, the last step is the deployment pipeline. And this is what lives at the center of, of continuous delivery. Um, this is like the meat of it, I guess. Um, and for this talk, I ended up deciding to use Circle CI. Um, and much like any of the, like the infra code tools I mentioned, like you've got a basically infinite amount of choice here. Um, you know, some people like having the CI tied to where the code lives. And for that, you could use something like GitHub Actions or GitLab CI. There's open source tools like Drone, which is what I talked about three years ago and is fantastic. Um, and Jenkins, if you really feel like you must. Um, but Circle is, is what I uh, chose for this talk. Um, so, <laughs> so here's just a quick little file of what it might look like for a CI pipeline for like a, a Terraform module, like this self-contained unit of infrastructure. Um, really the core thing we need here is to run those unit tests. Um, and that's for like a module, basically the only thing we need to do. Once we step into environments, like your, your staging and your prod environment, we have something that is going to actually plan things out. And then once we have an approval, um, did I highlight that? Yeah. Um, once you, so like this, you can see the, like, there's an approval here, which creates a little button in the circle UI that somebody has to click on. And then from there, we can actually run the Terraform apply. So this like structure is kind of predicated on the idea that you have environments that are just importing modules that are already fully tested because of that last pipeline file. And so from here, we don't need, no longer need to run those tests. It's, it's really just that plan and the apply. And so now we're going to try a demo that I spent all day trying to get to work. Um, and it does, but that happened like two hours ago. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, so I have just like a little um, Terraform project here that I'm gonna open up. Can you see? No. Okay, display settings. It was never gonna be perfect. Like, this, it's a live demo. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, hey, that worked, sweet. 
Um, so just a quick little Terraform template and really all this is doing is creating an Azure resource group. I used to work for Microsoft, so my, my heart bleeds blue. I'm loyal to Azure. Um, I, uh, so we've got a resource group, <laughs> uh, VNet, subnet, uh, Nick, and then a virtual machine. Um, and so if we make a change here, let's call this IP configuration two, and we can check out a new branch, change time, add our changes. And then push that up. Oh no. <laughs> Live demo. Oh yeah. I hate computers. Y'all are so good at this. <laughs> I didn't get on the Wi Fi ahead of time, so I can't push my changes. <laughs> Hashtag get after it, capital G, capital A, lowercase i. What? Hashtag what? Hashtag get after it, all capital G. Yeah, why don't you just, yeah, yeah, do it. <laughs> I'm sure Tad will cut that out of the video because I just chatted or yelled the password. Yeah. The real secret here is that live demo fuck-ups are actually more fun than a perfect demo, and so this was all planned. Did it work? I think it worked. Come on. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I made a typo. Got it. Sweet. All right. This is the future we live in. We chose this. Um, all right. So popping over to that repository, we can create this pull request here. Circle does all the work, which is fantastic. Um, we can go here, and, and this repository kind of models what it would be like to have an individual module checked into source control. And there's a lot of ways that you could manage that. You could have everything contained in a mono repo and you get sub modules, or you could have each module in its own individual repository with its own pipeline and testing. It's, it's really up to you. Um, so this is really just gonna run through and execute the, the Terra tests that I have set up for this. Um, and then it's going to um, ideally supply a green check mark back to me. And then from there, we would know that we could go forward with our environment management and like update the version tag for that module in an environment and then run our plan and apply from there. Um, I'm not going to let this finish because it takes like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something like that, because it's a VM and not a function. Um, I think with that, then. Um, I don't know if that was worthwhile then on y'all that you see that, it's fine. Um, so <laughs> I think the ultimate question that I wanted to answer is like, I guess why would we want to apply this, this workflow to infrastructure and not just software? And I'm actually gonna borrow from someone else's talk because I was at FOSDEM two weeks ago or a week ago. I don't know, time is lost to me. And, um, Chris by Tayer gave a, a very similar talk um, to the one that I gave at Config Management Camp. And he posed the question, like, if you are not doing continuous delivery for your infrastructure, like, are you even actually doing it? And I thought that was like an awesome way to frame that. Um, because like, so maybe you've got an awesome pipeline set up for your application and, and things are moving really, really fast. And every time you release a change, it makes it to prod really quickly. But then like, what happens when you need to fucking open a firewall port? And like the world grinds to a halt and somebody pops open a cloud provider UI and like you have to wait for them to actually click around. Um, that's not continuous delivery. Like, um, you've got some approximation of it, you've tried and great, 
like good for, for getting everything set up for your app. But I think really we ultimately need to kind of try and, and get this like idea to flow as far down the stack as we can to really embrace this idea. Um, uh, with that, I'll say thank you for listening. This is a, a huge turnout and it's, it's really, I appreciate you all coming to listen to me. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I can take some questions. We can do the questions live. Also, like, feel free to approach me after the thing, like, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, we have some questions for you. Just one for you. So you left off with the statement that if someone fucks up the port, we need, we need someone to open up a uh, firewall port, which we run to all the time. We have infrastructure going out, and then, yeah, we stop that because we have to wait for the network team to build a VIP, then we need for someone else to open up the firewall for how, what was your, what is your idea? What is your um, approach to things like that to automate that, especially in a massive infrastructure? So ideally, like at that point, and like, <laughs> like this is definitely like perfect world scenario, right? Like your infrastructure is managed through code completely. And so in that event, like you're going in to edit your template and add, um, like a new security group rule and then, you know, open a pull request against your master branch and have that flow through the pipeline and your, you know, the changes made. Um, again, I, this is making a lot of assumptions that like your infrastructure is hosted on something like OpenStack or VMware or public cloud and that you are currently managing things through an infra code tool. Um, beyond that, I think like if, if you're not at that point yet, it's, it's a, a converse, like a cultural conversation about leveling up to, you know, do the DevOps thing and the, the transformation thing. And yeah. All right. Thanks. He took half my question. So I only have a question. That was great. Sorry, that was, and yeah, when you were closing, you, you, you talked about, you know, again, opening up a firewall port. And as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, even sort of day two things, operational things, things, something goes bump in the night, it's Sunday morning and there's a ticket and the tier one people, something's wrong, right? A pager duty goes off and there's, there's an issue. Um, less of a question, more of a please expound freely. Can you see, how do you see this kind of philosophy helping out that the tier one, tier two knock people, those day two running operation things be after we've deployed, but something broke. I think ideally like this kind of workflow would have you trending in the direction of like, like fully immutable infrastructure. And so if we have something that comes up like that, like ideally the first line might be to just do a redeploy um, and hope that fixes things. Uh, yeah, exactly. Have you tried blowing it up and recreating it completely? Um, but can you, okay, so but I'm, 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 should I add like an hour next one? Uh, Maybe we can. It depends. Like, I think, again, in a perfect world, like. Why don't I just shoot ahead and see what happens? Yeah. Um, yeah I'm, I'm just going to run a mic back to you because we want people on the video to know what he's reacting to. That's, that's fair enough. So what was I yelling about? Oh, um, so when we, from an operational standpoint, I think you make a good point. Maybe we do, especially if we've got infrastructure as code, if we're blue green deploying it and doing everything we're supposed to do. Maybe I tell my tier one knock people, hey, the first thing you should do is murder it. Shoot it in the head and let it come back up because we've built our environment that way and don't escalate this before you've tried, you know, something homicidal. It's fun. It definitely is like one of those perfect world scenarios, but like, yeah, hopefully like, you know, that, I, think, I think that's the thing to strive for at least. Hey, Xander. I'm Kevin. I saw your drone talk that you gave here three years ago. Oh, kind nice. of a fanboy. Yeah. Where are you? Uh, I'm way back here. Okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a question that was kind of relating to that, which yeah. was uh, you have experience with HashiCorp and how it works. Are they looking to get into the uh, CI CD space? Because I mean, they have all these great base tools. It seems logical that they would progress that into a different product. 
I can only speculate. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm not sure. We, um, I can say that right now, like our, and um, those of you who've kind of followed what we've been doing might see this reflected in, in our roadmap and the action we've been taking. Um, I think the logical next steps for us are um, trending towards online services um, and hosted versions of our tools. Um, and I think that's a big focus right now. Um, uh, as far as like what future products might look like, yeah, I, I could only speculate and I don't want to do that because PR, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, okay, question. Why do you prefer Circle CI over Travis? <laughs> um, honestly, I don't. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think I think um, any of the CI tools out there that are like executing their stages in a container. Um, and following that workflow that like Circle and Travis and Drone do, I think they all serve their purpose very well. Um, I just grabbed one randomly. Hello. I'm very curious. Yeah, where did I go? Yeah, very curious generally about how you're testing the Terraform before you do that final Terraform apply in a GitOps workflow or what, whatever you call it. Um, more specifically, uh, when you do the testing, you said you bring the infrastructure completely up to do that. Are you starting from a completely clean slate? Yeah, so or... ideally it's it's deploying into like a, a test subscription or a test account. Um, and in a perfect world, like you've got a module that you're testing. And so that isn't going to have state maintained because it's just going to be imported into an environment. And so, within your CI pipeline, you've got that wired up to a subscription on, on a cloud provider and then are just spinning up that module, module so it has a life long enough to do your basic tests. And I think the, the test that I wrote for this example was like, make sure that the name that I defined in the Terraform template, I would use the Azure SDK, actually hit the Azure API and ensure that those names line up is like a, basically like the example that I, I had to like show the capability. Um, I definitely need to do my own, like some more research myself on like what actual practical tests are for these sorts of things and like where it makes sense to invest the time in, in running something like terror tests, like, and actually like what you want to validate that makes sense. But yes, um, ideally you're testing individual modules that aren't like actually wired up to an environment that have state maintained. Uh, I, I have a follow-up question on TerraTest. Um, does that require a lot of, you, you said that was uh, written in Golang? Yes. Does it require uh, a fair amount of knowledge of Golang to be able to write effective tests? Um, I would say no, only for the fact that they have extensive examples in the repository. Um, if they didn't, maybe, but they really have done a great job of, of documenting what an example unit test looks like for almost every case. So, mostly no. Uh, I have a question about any other tooling that you might include in your pipeline. Like we're starting to explore with Terraform uh, compliance, I think, when the open source modules are. Where do you sort of see that fitting in or maybe complementing in the pipeline? Hmm. You know, I don't know that I have dealt with compliance requirements around certain environments enough in my Terraform usage to authoritatively answer. Um, so I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to mislead you. Um, what I would recommend is probably posting on our, our community forum, like discuss.hashicorp.com and the Terraform subcategory. Um, Security and, and and that sort of thing is, is not my my area of expertise, and so I, I would probably leave that to those folks that know much more than I do about that space. Okay, non-technical, more of a culture question. Um, how do you market this capability to development teams? Because I have a team that's trying to build this. I'm the product owner. 
I'm trying to figure out how to make a market for this with my development team so that they want to own, you know, kind of engaging with this. Well, I think about like, I guess my time on development teams and like, there's, there's never anything more frustrating than like waiting on a dependent team, like wait, like having to put in a request to somebody else and wait for that to come back to me. Um, so I think honestly, the idea of more end to end ownership is a like, at least for me, when I was working at like on a software team, like that would have been a great selling point. I guess I can't speak for everybody, but from my own experience, like that, that's what comes to mind. Do you anticipate having some testing features built into Terraform Enterprise in the future? Just, I know it's kind of open source driven right now. Do you think that's part of the roadmap? Yes, um, particularly around um, things like RBAC and like, um, and again, the space I don't know as much about, but like security requirements. Um, I, I think I would expect to see a bit of progress around things like policy, particularly like policy as code and validating that kind of stuff. Hi, Xander. My Hello. name is also Kevin. Um, I was also at your drone talk and I'm also kind of a fanboy. <laughs> uh, hi, Kevin. So, hi. So uh, right now the the pull request is merged and then I do a Terraform reply from my, my MacBook and I, I feel great shame. Um, my question is, where is the community at with true continuous and true continuous delivery here? Like, are they actually, like how much of the community is actually testing and truly deploying in an automated fashion through the pipeline? That's um, a good question. I think like it probably trends more towards the enterprise side when it comes to Terraform. Like, people are starting to use Terraform and they really like it um, and they want to start doing more CD stuff. And that's at the point where they come knocking on the VP's door and asking for Terraform Enterprise. And being that I work mostly with our open source community, I think the thing I'm trying to do is like put out there that like, this is a thing that like you can do with our open source tooling. Like they, not to like knock our enterprise product, there's a lot that I can give you, but like, I think there's, there's a lot you can do with the open source side of things too, if you're willing to do the engineering like work on your own. And um, I think there's a, there's a lot of folks using Atlantis, which is a, an open source tool that's kind of been absorbed by Terraform Cloud at this point. Um, and Atlantis is awesome, um, but Terraform Cloud being a free product for up to five users, like I think the focus is largely there at the moment. Um, yeah, I think, I don't, I don't know, I hope to see larger community um, embracement of, uh, of CICD for like the open source product. Thanks. Hi. Um, so my question is, what's, what's the intersection and or relevance of this with Kubernetes and containers and all that good stuff that's happening out there? I think, well, well, Kubernetes, that's the <laughs> elephant in every room, let me tell you. <laughs> I used to work on Azure Kubernetes service, so like I, it's my whole life. Um, I think um, yeah, I'm literally falling apart at the mention of Kubernetes. Um, I I guess it depends on how often changes are being made at the infrastructure level to the cluster. Um, whether like a scale up is, is a frequent occurrence. I do think that there is um, potential here for upgrades. Um, I know that's been a painful thing with, um, with Kubernetes in the past. I think the thing with Kubernetes that kind of muddies this is that like, there's been so much progress in managed Kubernetes services and so many folks are trending in that direction you know, using AKS or GKE um, and like those things, like the infra is completely abstracted away. And so like, if you have the capability to use something like that, like, yeah, do it, it's, it's fucking awesome and easy. Um, but that kind of like abstracts away the picture of having to deal with infrastructure delivery if, if you're using a managed service. Um, if it's something you're doing yourself on like you've got the machines hosted on VMware, I think I think there's a lot of practicality there. And, and you can actually 
manage Kubernetes clusters with the Terraform provider for Kubernetes. And so like you can, you know, if you are doing that, you can keep things all in the same tool chain, which is nice, but Kubernetes intersects with all things always. Like it's inescapable. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dave and I was also at your growing talk. <laughs> And what I'm seeing here is I've had a long enough career is like, oh, this is software defined networking plus testing. <laughs> and uh, what I'm also seeing is the scope creep in the industry is we have DevOps, then we have DevSecOps, and then we, I think we're going to have DevSecNetOps, <laughs> and it's going to be corporations defined by software. <laughs> and it's, it, 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 it's a necessity that, that's growing in scope that um, as things go faster, we need to define them with all the software eventually. And uh, before cloud, this really wasn't possible very quickly. So things to think of. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Xander. Hello. I'm Liam. I missed your drone talk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll forgive you. I'm gonna find that. <laughs> but I am a former DBA, so you probably might know where this is going. So we have, we definitely have grokked infrastructure as code for the uh, standing up of our databases, including and especially the ones that are managed services like RDS. But the continuous delivery part has sort of escaped us because anytime you have something that requires replacement, that's a potential disaster if it's production, right? Where do you see that fitting in this pipeline and how do you manage that? Yeah, you called out the single hardest part of this is like, I mean, it always is, right? Staple workloads, like it's always the the pain. Um, and particularly around like, I know some of the cloud providers, like if you're even gonna try and make a change to the like sizing of, of um, managed database instances, like it blows it away, like, yeah. Um, I don't have a great answer for you, unfortunately. <laughs> like, I really wish I did. Um, yeah, it's honestly, yeah, it's the hardest part of actually doing continuous delivery is managing the state of it all. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I I sympathize. Like maybe that's something, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben. I was there. <laughs> I'm Ben. Uh, I was there. You need to not hit the button. I need to not. Don't touch. Okay. I'm Ben. I was there. I'm also a fan. I touched the button. I'm wondering how that demo went, uh, if you left it running and how. Oh, yeah. Out. Let's take a look. I think it's probably still there. Um, I went through demo hell today because as it turns out, the, um, the environment variables that the Terraform Azure provider and the Golang Azure SDK wants are completely, one of them is ARM client ID and one of them is Azure client ID. So you need like eight environment variables and um, the auth on my local machine was falling back to CLI authentication and yeah, good, good times. Um, so yeah, we have a, a validated test here um, and if you want to actually see like what that test was it was pretty straightforward just like you know taking the output from Terraform on the VM name and the resource group name and then using the Azure client SDK to actually fetch the name of that VM and comparing the two to make sure that they lined up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I did have a quick follow-up question. It seems uh, TerraTest is good for sort of unit testing your infrastructure as code. Uh, I'm wondering mainly more like integration testing of your uh, infrastructure as code or what thoughts you have on that. Um, more specifically, once again, I, I've been having the issue where we merge our code and then it does the TF apply and it has a state that's already there and then then it craps itself. Uh, what can we do generally to like sort of integrate test that? Um, ha have you experimented with that? 
Um, it's something I need to do more of my own research on too. And I, I thought a lot about that leading up to the talk too. And like that, I think that's kind of a logical next step for like the research that I'm doing on this. and like trying to figure it out. Um, I think like the, the thing that immediately comes to mind is like various sanity checks through the environments, like as you promote, but like that only takes you so far. Like, um, yeah, having, a good like testing and staging environment that you're deploying to and then um, what it actually looks like to crawl those environments and, and test the integrations, I don't quite know yet, but I think that's probably where I'll go next. Sorry, I don't have an immediate answer. But... Well, I guess it's me, I'm Andy from CHS. Uh, I have a question. I'm, I'm not an advocate for testing production, but I'm starting to advocate test production. So when you roll out uh, anything new, whether in touching infrastructure as code, you need not testing the software itself that's running on that infrastructure and it blows up and you don't realize that's what caused it was the infrastructure somebody changed without it. What do you think about that? What's I think it makes sense. Like <laughs> we're, uh, <laughs> I think especially with like the age of Kubernetes, we are in like this land of abstraction after abstraction after abstraction and that makes things hard to like debug down to the root. And I think focusing like that testing effort um, upon each layer might help unmuddy some of that abstraction. I think that makes sense. Hi, uh, I'm Katie and sorry Xander, this is actually not for you, but all the people with database opinions, stuff, can you find lady in the pink shirt after? Cause I wanna hear all your opinions about all this. <laughs> Nice. I love that. that. Um, and that it, I think that it makes sense when you think about, we have this meetup, we see a presentation. Thank you, Xander. And then we all mob Xander afterwards to ask him individual sequential questions, which is traditional, but we also talk to each other. So make sure you are having those conversations. And I, I do have a question myself before we check and see if there's any other questions. Uh, you were you were talking about Kubernetes, and of course we all want to Kuber some Netties at every moment. Um, but uh, I know Hashi has a container orchestrator as well. Do you want to give us a quick shout out to that? Yeah, I, I, I certainly can. And I, um, <laughs> uh, in my time at HashiCorp, I've, I've been there since September, and I, I've been largely focused on Terraform. And so um, I, I've been trying to learn Nomad little by little, though. And that, that's the name of the tool is Nomad. Um, and I think um, it's it's worth playing around with. Um, there's definitely a bit of overlap with Kubernetes functionality, but I think um, where we end up getting a lot of people playing with Nomad is if you have mixed workloads that you know things that are running on um, uh, in a container or on a VM. Um, I think Nomad supports workloads outside of just your typical Docker containers. So um, something to play around with. Um, it's easy to deploy to. Um, we also have lots of exciting Kubernetes integrations coming. So, yeah. Exciting. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, my question is, uh, if you have a different environment like dev, test, and QA, and production, uh, sometimes we don't give uh, developer a production environment. Uh, yeah, Terraform, that means you run in dev, in dev environment, but sometimes you need to do extra thing configuration, especially in AWS environment. If you have your database, your every infrastructure is set up as a code. Do you, in your experience, do you give your code to somebody running test, a production type of environment? I think at least the practice that I would try to follow is um, I'm personally an advocate for having your environments um, separated by repository. So having a, a repository for stage um, test and prod and then importing the modules that you need for each environment. And from there, like, you know, you kind of offload that R back to the, the version control provider and you, know, you can give uh, users access to those repositories as such. Hi, I was wondering if you could uh, riff a little bit into the Atlantean versus the uh, open source project you're working on. Um, Atlantis. Um, it's, yeah, it's an awesome tool. And actually the, the original developer works on my team. Um, he's wonderful. Um, but I think with 
Atlantis, where we're at on that is like we had HashiCorp engineers um, spending time working on developing that with the launch of Terraform Cloud, which has a free tier for less than five users. Um, unlimited number of repositories and workspaces, just limited to five users at the free tier, that contains all of the functionality of Atlantis. And so that's where the engineering effort is. Atlantis will continue to function, but I wouldn't expect to see like feature development um, in that space at the moment. Um, yeah, and then like with Terraform Cloud, you know, the free tier, like you can always use a service account or something to, to get around that five user limit if you know you don't need. We all know about it. Um, like <laughs> you're not gonna get that granular R back, but like, hey, whatever, if your team is relatively small, it's fine. Um, and so I think, but as far as functionality, I think, you know, Atlantis might line up pretty closely with, with this like homegrown CI solution. It's just, you know, we won't see new features there, I wouldn't think. Okay, I think that's all the questions for the moment, um, at least all the questions for the whole room. Uh, so can we give Xander a round of applause?